Romans 8, we're going to begin reading verse number 5. The Bible says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are after the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. I'm going to stop there. Now, the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Rome. Chapter number 8. Everybody pretty familiar with verse number 1. There's now therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. That word condemned means that you were dead or that you were sentenced to death. And there was nothing that you or anybody else could have done to change it. Right? The terminology that you, you, you see in the old Western movies is that's a dead man walking. Right? He's still breathing right now, but he's dead, and there's nothing he can do to change that. There's coming a day, a time, an appointment that he's dead, and it cannot be stopped. Right? That's what condemned means. Well, hallelujah, there's now, now, therefore, no condemnation. Before Christ, there still was condemnation. Right? All man was sentenced to die because of what? Sin. Right? Now, when's he writing this? After Christ came. He says, now, doesn't have to be condemnation. Because of Christ, because of what Christ did, there is no final verdict for your life. You now have a choice. Right? I'll remind you, John 3, 17, Christ came not into the world to do what? Condemn it. He came to lift condemnation. He came to liberate from those things that we call shackles of sin. But, verse number 5, he's talking about what happens in that transformation after we receive Christ. He says, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. Now that just makes sense. Right? If you're a Kentucky fan, you hate Louisville. Okay? It's just how it goes. Right? If you're an Ohio State fan, you hate Michigan. Right? We know these things. Right? That just makes sense. Okay, if it looks like a duck, acts like a duck, walks like a duck, talks like a duck, it's a duck. Right? Well, if you like the world, you spend your time in the world, you want to live your life to please those that are in the world, you're going to be after the world. Those that do mind the flesh. Well, what is the flesh? The flesh, spiritually speaking, is that part of you that's not saved. That part of you that still has the curse of sin and has to go to the ground one day when we pass through the grave. Right? The flesh is the part of you that still clings to the old man, the original nature. Right? The edemic nature, not that Christ-like nature. Right? That's the one that was conceived in sin, born in sin, was a sinner by practice and a sinner by trade. Right? That's the part of you that still would choose to sin if not for God. Right? The fleshly man, to mind the flesh, means to give in to the if you will, the root of sin, which is, as you've heard our pastor say so many times, my right to my claim to myself. The fleshly man does what he wants to do because he wants to do it. There's no other reason to it. Now, there's a lot of reasons that people do things, but it all comes down to they wanted to do it. Right? No one's going to be able to stand before the throne of God, whether it's at the judgment seat of Christ or the great white throne of judgment, and say that the devil made them do it. Right? That's one of the greatest lies that the devil has, that it was just out of your hands. No, you had a choice. The fleshly man makes his choice, and he doesn't want anybody to talk about it, doesn't want to be reprimanded for it, doesn't want to be judged for it. He wants to be what he wants to be, and everybody else to either ignore him or to be okay with it. Right? That's why such a small minority, don't know where this came from, this is nowhere in the notes, but... That's why such a small minority of the queers and the gays and the LGBTQ add every alphabet letter. It's a very small population, but why are they so loud? Because they want to live the way that they want to live and be openly accept accepted for it. It's not enough to not be judged. They want people to hug them and tell them how brave they are. That's a fleshly nature. 
The fleshly nature is one that is rooted in pride. It's all about me. Right? It may, for a time, look like they're not living for themselves, but you hang around long enough. I'll remind you what Proverbs says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. You hang around somebody long enough, they're going to start talking about the things that they seek out, the things that they hope will satisfy them, the things that they live their life or they put time in on the job so that they can go and use that money for those things. Right? The fleshly nature, verse number 5, they do mind the things of the flesh. Now, to mind the things of the flesh doesn't mean to just obey the flesh. Right? If you mind certain things, that means that it's on your mind, literally. The reason that you mind the law is because you remember the law. Because when you are confronted with the situation, you know in your head what the law says and what you want to do. But you choose to do what the law says because you are mindful of it. You cannot be obedient to something that isn't in the forefront of your mind. Because obedience, just like disobedience, is a choice. So to mind the things of the flesh, to obey the flesh, your thoughts have to be fleshly. Because if you weren't thinking about things that are pertain to the flesh, you wouldn't do things that pertain to the flesh. Right? It's not just that it's a part of you, you've allowed it to dominate you. To dominate your mind, to dominate your dreams, to dominate your ambitions, your goals in life. When the flesh takes that much hold of your life, right, it takes an act of God to deliver you from it. And you say, why do you say that, Brother Jordan? I'm not a humanist that believes that if you think hard enough or if you want to hard enough, you can do it. If you were strong enough to overcome your flesh, Christ wouldn't have had to have come. The only reason that you were free from the flesh in the first place is because of the blood of Christ. The only way to remain free of the flesh is to ask the Lord to help you with those things that are too high for you. The fleshly man is stronger than you if you give him the opportunity because he doesn't fight fair. He uses cheap shots and sucker punches and stabs in the back. All for what? Because he wants to be in control. That's his very nature. But then it says, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit, they mind the things of the Spirit. Did not David say that it's, he hid the word of God in his heart that he might not sin against him? What does that hide away? He made it safe. He made it secure. He put it somewhere that it couldn't be touched or taken away or corrupted or lost. Right? It was in a sacred place in his heart that he kept fortified. Now because it's in his heart, it was also on his mind. You know what you think about? The things that are dearest to you. Right? When you go away on vacation, you know the things that you ought to be thinking about? The things that are dearest to you, which is usually the people you're on vacation with. Right? Shouldn't be thinking about things on the job. Mine have priorities out of line. The things that you think about are the things that have the highest priority in your heart. Well, verse number 6, it says, For to be carnally minded is death. It does not say to be carnally minded leads to death. It doesn't say that that's the end road. No. To be carnally minded is death. Present tense. <laughs> Means the moment that you start to become carnally minded, your spirituality starts to die. Jesus himself said, a man cannot serve two masters. The minute that the love of the flesh comes back into your heart, the love for God dies out. And vice versa. You say, why, Brother Jordan? What well, says to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Isn't that just how God does things? You know what you get with the flesh? You get one thing. You know what you get with the spirit? Two things. He's always able to outdo whatever it is that the world can conjure up. He doesn't just give you life. He says, oh, by the way, just this little add-on here, you also get peace. To be spiritually minded is life. Why? Because you are embracing, you are utilizing that new creature that God birthed in your heart when he saved you. The thing that the Holy Ghost sealed on the day of your salvation, your soul, was transformed at the moment of salvation into something that is holy and righteous. 
because the blood of Christ was applied. Now the reason the Holy Ghost sealed it is because you can't keep it that way. But one of these days you're going to meet up with what God has all prepared for you and that soul which has been sealed is going to be revealed, right, and put into a body just like Christ and you'll be just like Christ. Not you'll look like Him. Not that you sound like Him. Not that you walk like Him. No. You will be as Christ, the Bible teaches. The only thing that will separate us from Christ in heaven is that He's got nail prints in His hands and He's got a gap in His side where He received the marks in His body to pay for our sin debt. You don't believe me? We did the study on Revelation. I showed y'all. John the Revelator knew what Christ looked like and yet he bowed down to somebody to do worship unto him and the guy stopped him and said, whoa, 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 don't worship me, I'm your fellow servant. Why did John bow down? Because he looked just like Jesus. He sounded just like Jesus. John realized, oh, we're all really going to be just like him. And I thought, it, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if we get to heaven and we find out that the one that John went and bowed down was himself in the future. Just a little bit of God saying, He didn't lie, He was your fellow servant. But, it says, Be carly minded is life and peace. That new creature, it can only do one thing. That new creature, because it's sealed, your soul does not know sin right now, if you say it. It's sealed. Now, that container can get pretty dirty. You can take a mason jar, put something in it, and seal it up. You can go bury it in the backyard. It can be covered in dirt and grime, and the lid can have all kind of corrosion. But as long as that seal's not broke, everything on the inside's fresh. Right? Your soul does not know sin. So when you are mindful of the new creature, you know what he has on his heart? The new creature has things like fruit on his mind. Not just the fruits of the Spirit, but the call to go out and to bear much fruit. The call to go out and plant seed. You do realize that everything that Christ asks us to do, study your Bible. Whether it's going out and sowing seed, whether it's going out and becoming fishers of men to catch the souls of men out of the depths of hell, everything is an illustration of things that you do and labor for that bring about new life. You think there was any accident? No, because if you are spiritually minded your spirit bears witness with his spirit y'all are in unity all he knows is life all he's concerned about is those that are dead that need to be brought to life everything that you do should be about what? furthering the kingdom of God the kingdom of heaven is only concerned with what? life he came so that life could be introduced to a sinful man so to be spiritually minded of course it's life but because you know where your life came from and because he gave us the grace and the mercy of knowing what the future holds through the book of Revelation, you've got peace on where you're going, who's walking with you, the one that watches over you day and night that's put an angel and given him charge over you. Your soul knows peace because it has fellowship with the Prince of Peace. But, verse number 7, here's why. Those two are on polar ends of the spectrum. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Why to be carnally minded is it death? Because to mind the flesh, to mind the things of the world, to do those things that come natural to the old man, you are at enmity with God. That means you've made yourself the enemy of God. Enmity is a gulf that there is no peaceful resolution to. Right? There are people sometimes you say, well, I had a rift with somebody. Rifts can be healed. Right? God forbid I rip a hole in this suit today. Okay? That can be mended. Right? Some things are torn, but they can be stitched back together. If there's enmity, there's no repairing that relationship. When Adam chose to sin in the garden, 
irreparable damage was done between the flesh that God had created and breathed life into and a holy God. In fact, it's the reason that one of these days God has promised that he'll destroy the earth with fire. Because sin didn't just corrupt man, it corrupted man's domain. All evidence of sin one day will be eradicated. The only reminder of sin is going to be this half of the word of God preserved in heaven talking about what Christ did in order for us to get there. But the Bible also says that he wipes away all tears from our... We won't remember the pain of sin. We won't have a memory of what it was to commit sin. Because he promised there'd be no pain there. There'd be no suffering there. There'd be no rem The only reminder will be the very word of God preserved in heaven. Now you say, Brother Jordan, if the flesh is enmity with God, doesn't the Bible say that we are made kings and priests kings to rule and reign over this flesh? Yes. It says you can rule over it. It didn't say you had to become part of it. There are too many Christians going around today trying to do things for the Lord under the power of the flesh. And it's not going to work. Because to be fleshly minded is to become the enemy of God. Is it any wonder that the Bible tells us to not trust in the arm of flesh? Why? Because it will fail you. It's a certain statement. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but one day it's going to come up short because it's imperfect. It is flawed. But you as a Christian can compel the flesh to do things that it does not want to do. That's called exerting control over the flesh. And it's not just getting it to do things that it doesn't want to do. You can plunge it smack dab into the perfect will of God and keep it there. Because God commanded us to do it and promised that he would help us do it. And God wouldn't have commanded you to do it if you were incapable of doing it. Does it take a lot of effort? Yes. Are there days that you feel like quitting? Yeah. But you can do it. Because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. He was greater than your flesh the day that he separated your soul from it. And today he's still greater than your flesh. It's not relying upon your own strength to do it. It's by faith believing that Christ will do what you cannot. But the flesh is at enmity with God. It is the enemy of God. You can't hang out with God's enemy and still be called his friend. Because Christ said that he did not call his servants. He called his friends. And because we were friends, what did he do? He told us everything that the Father told him. He held nothing back. Well, in the eyes of the Lord, don't you think that we're holding something back from him if we're associating with the enemy? Now, it said that Christ was the friend of publicans and sinners, but he was never a partaker with publicans and sinners. You can cohabitate with this thing called the flesh and still be holy. Be holy as I am holy. In fact, God left you a perfect manual on how to do it. Gave you everything that you needed to know. He was in the world, but he was not of the world. Right? He was robed in flesh, but he didn't have flesh like ours. His flesh knew no sin. And he was our example. He was made our high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Why? So that he can succor them that do come to him. He was tempted in all points like we are, yet was he without sin. Why? So he could tell you how to overcome it. So that he can give you the example of how he did it. And then promise that he'll be there every step of the way with you as you do it. You think that you can have that cooperation and that relationship with God if on the side you're hanging out with the enemy? No. Because to hang out with the enemy, you've got to leave the Lord's camp. The enemy is not welcome around the things of God. Can't be trusted. So in order to get to where the enemy is, where do you have to go to where the enemy is? It can't come to you. You've got to leave God to get back to the flesh. But then, verse number 7 also says, For it is not subject to the law of God. 
To be subject to something means that you recognize authority. That you submit yourself. That you yield your will because you believe that somebody else has the right to tell you and that their will is correct. The flesh cannot be subject to anything other than itself. We've already talked about that. It is selfish down to the core. In fact, I'll tell you this today. You don't even know how prideful you can be on your own because outside of the grace of God, your heart is more deceitful and wicked than even you know. It's only by the grace of God we're not worse than anybody that you can find in history. But it says, it cannot be subject to the law of God. It will not yield and submit to the law of God, but it can be compelled to. You know what that word compel means? You make something happen even though somebody else doesn't want it. The flesh will never want to do the things of God, but you can make it do the things of God. Right? There's sometimes that a cow, an oxen, or you know some donkey, mule, pick whatever animal you want, pulling a plow, doesn't want to pull the plow. You know what the farmer has to do? He has to compel it. Sometimes he's got to put a little snack in his hand, right? appease it for a second. But you know where the road goes? All the way down to the end of the line. The farmer makes sure that the plow ends up at the end of the road. Then when he gets there, you know what he does? They turn around and they come back. Until what? It's finished. Now you can't appease your flesh, but you know what you can do? You can force it to get into the yoke. And the Lord said that his yoke was easy and his burden was light. Said that he was meek and lowly. Said that he doesn't expect you to pull all the load. He expects you to pull your load and he'll pull the rest. You know what that is? That's compelling the flesh to do it. Right? You've got spurs, spiritual spurs that you can kick the flesh with and it'll cause it to move. Right? You've got a whip that you can crack and it'll put the fear of God into the flesh. There are ways, without violating anything that the Bible says is holy, you can make the flesh do what is right in the eyes of God. You don't believe me? Jesus took a whip and he caused the flesh of a whole bunch of other people to do what was right in the eyes of God. Did he harm them? No. Did he do it out of hatred? No. He did it in righteous indignation. Because it was the right thing to do and he knew no one else was going to do it. No one else is going to whip your flesh into shape. That's a job for you. God can't force you or force your flesh to do the will of God. You have to choose to do it. But that's why it cannot be subject to the law. It's why it's impossible. Because if left to its own choice, the flesh will always choose anything but God. It says, so then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. I don't see a question mark at the end of that verse. That is a factual statement, an emphatic statement. Those that are in the flesh cannot please God. Now what's in the flesh mean? It means that you've embraced it. You utilize it. Okay, Jesus told us to take up our cross and to follow him. Jesus took his cross, he bore it up a mountain, and then he left it there when he was done because he didn't need it anymore. Why did he tell us to take ours up and follow after him? Where do you think the flesh is supposed to stay? But on the cross. You got to nail it to the cross to keep it from interfering. Now, just because you take it with you doesn't mean that you're in it. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? I'm going to give you a real simple example here. You may have a car, it's rusted out, engine hadn't run in about 15 years, it's dead. Right? You could put a battery in it, battery's going to shorten spark, you might get a fire. Right? You can try everything in the world to take that bucket of bolts and make it run again like it used to. It's not going to. It's dead. Well, if you put it on a trailer, you got to get into the thing that's hooked up to the trailer in order to move it. You know what you're in? You're in the truck. You're not in the car that's on the trailer. Now, there's some people trying to get old. They're sitting in the driver's seat, old, rusted out things called the flesh, trying to get it to go places and do things. It's not going to. It's dead. 
But see, Christ told me to go. Well, I've got to take it with me, but I don't have to be in it. I can be in the truck. I can be in a camper. I can be in a whole bunch of things. I mean, some cars nowadays got tow hitches, right? There's a whole bunch of ways that you can cause that thing to move without being in it. Same is true when it comes to your spirituality. Just because the flesh has to come with you doesn't mean that it's driving, that it's making the choices, that it has a say in the outcome. You're dragging it along like a dog that didn't want to go on a walk, but you're making it go on a walk anyway. You got to yell at it. You might drag it a couple of times. It may slow you down, but you're going to get to where you're going. That says, verse number 9, but ye are not in the flesh. Who's he talking to? Save folk. More important than that, he's talking to a called out local assembly of believers. He's writing to a church. He's writing them an epistle to encourage them to further their spirituality. He says, you're in the church because you don't desire to be fleshly. You joined the church and disassociated with the world because you don't want to be a part of the old man. You want to live as the new man. He says, ye are not in the flesh. That's present tense. He says, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Well, you can read your Bible. And you're never going to find that after God saves somebody, the Spirit of God ever departs from them. You're never going to find that what He sealed, He lets go of. Even as they were beating Christ in the hall of the praetorium, they gave Him a reed, which is a dried piece of grass. Very fragile, very easy to crack. But yet, even as they beat him and buffeted him and plucked out his beard, after it all was done, it says they took the reed back. Because anything that's committed unto Christ, he keeps it just the way that it was given to him. Your soul is just as pristine as the day that you got saved because it was committed into the hands of Christ. Because of that, the Spirit of God dwells in you. But there's a difference between being sealed and being inhabited. You know what dwell means? To take up residence in. There's a lot of churches that God has stamped the name Ichabod over the doors. They can go through all of the motions. It doesn't mean that God's going to show up. Just because you are saved doesn't mean that you've got fellowship with Him. The Bible does call us a tabernacle for what? The Holy Ghost. You know where I find that God hangs out? Places that He's welcome. If you're not very welcoming because you've taken up sides with the flesh again, doesn't mean that the Spirit's dwelling in you. He sealed you. He's still a part of you. But God will back away when you back away. And you know what happens when you turn around? If you draw nigh to Him, He draws nigh to you. God will let you make whatever choice you want. But we've got to live with the consequences. If you are full of the Holy Ghost, you're not in the flesh. Because you can't be in the flesh and full of the Holy Ghost. It's one or the other. But it does say, If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. That's the difference between having it and using it. You may have the Holy Ghost because you got saved, but you may not be using it. There's a lot of people. You know why I bought my car? Because I liked it and I wanted to drive it. And God said it was okay. Right? I know a lot of people that have cars, they never drive them. They've got it, but they're not using it. Oh, it would cause the value to go down. I bought it to drive it. And I'm going to drive it the way I want to drive it. Right? I'm paying insurance on it. I'm losing money even if it don't go nowhere. I'm going to drive it. That's just the way that my mind works. Well, you can have the Holy Ghost, but it's a different thing to ask the Holy Ghost to have you. For Him to dwell. You've got the car keys. You know what the keys open up? It's called Victorious Christian Living. But there's a lot of people that have it, and they've got it under a dust cover because they think as long as they keep it safe, it'll still be the same the next time they get in it. 
if you're like me, you're going to find the next time you get in it, the steering wheel's a little bit closer to your stomach than it was the last time. That seat belt's not as comfortable as it was. Or if you've got a family member that buys a convertible Corvette, you find you can only fit in the Corvette if the top's already down. Otherwise, your head sticks up higher than the glass window. Right? So every time he says, well, if any of them ask, if I, can, I can't fit in it. I can't ask to borrow it. I can't drive it. Okay? I sat in the driver's seat one time. It's got the heads-up display. shows you the speed limit or the speed you're going up on the glass of the actual window. I can't see it. I can see the light bulb that's shining off of the reflection, but i got to like get down like this in order to see the speed. I can't drive that thing. Don't want to drive that thing. Last time I drove one of his cars, I did like $20,000 worth of damage to it. That was a fun day. It was many, many moons ago. Long time ago. And it was all because of girl preacher. I was driving to South Carolina. Icy ramp. Rear end drive Cadillac. Center median of the interstate. Anyway. The difference between having it and using it. Same is true with the Holy Ghost. Then verse number 10. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. Again, is dead. Certain. If you're walking hand in hand with Christ, if Christ is as much in you as you are in Him, well, how much are you in Him? You're engraved in the palm of His hands. There's nothing in heaven or earth that can separate you from the love of God, the Bible teaches. There's nothing that can undo what God did. God could, but He promised He never would. So you can take that to the bank. You've been birthed into the family, adopted into the family. One of these days you're going to be married into the family. God did it three times so that nobody would be confused on whether or not you're in the family. You're in. But just because you're in doesn't mean that He's in you. It says if Christ be in you, to be full of the Holy Ghost. You want to know what full of the Holy Ghost looks like? Looks like Stephen. Stephen was named a deacon. Why? Because he was full of the Holy Ghost. He had a pattern of being submitted to and doing whatever it was that God told him to do. In the midst of an angry crowd, Stephen reared back and preached righteousness to him, even though he knew he would, they wouldn't like it. The Bible says that they tried to run him over and yet he still kept on preaching. They tried to shut him up by trampling him, and that didn't work. So then they started gnawing on him. That didn't work either. He didn't feel a thing of it. Why? Because he was totally given over to God. Then it says that they stoned him. He didn't feel that either. Because instead of looking at the people getting ready to throw stones at him, he caught a glimpse of another world. You say, is that going to happen to me? The word of God's come. God's done with signs and wonders. But I've seen people go through a whole lot in this world that would have broken anybody else. But yet they weathered the storm and they were still looking towards the throne of God in heaven as their destination. How did they do that? They got a good dose of the Holy Ghost. It says, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. We found out why the flesh was the enemy of God and is at enmity with God. We found out why it cannot be subject. You know why? As a Christian, you can be alive. It's because of the righteousness of God. How would you get saved? Not by works of righteousness, which we have done. You know why you're robed in righteousness? Because he had a robe, because he was righteous, and he gifted it to you. You know why you can have the righteousness of God in your life now? Because he indwells you to hold on to it. If the flesh were to touch it, it'd become corrupt. It wouldn't be righteous anymore. We've already said the two polar opposites. Doesn't matter how much you sifted or sorted or anything else. If you get dirt into water, there's very few ways to ever ensure that it's 100% pure ever again. God can do it. He can cleanse you. He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all of unrighteousness. But you can't do it. So if God gives you something pure, who's got to hold on to it? God. Every time you need it, what do you do? You got to go and you got to ask God to let it, you use it. 
you've got to ask God to come with you, use it, and then take it back to where God got it from. You cannot be the keeper of your own righteousness. You know what that's called? It's called self-righteousness. And you know what self-righteousness is? Not righteousness, or else it would be called righteousness. We wouldn't have two words. Life comes from what? The righteousness of God. That's why God's breath, when he breathed it into Adam, man became a living soul. Because God's breath was just absolutely drenched in righteousness. Everything that he made, you know why it sprung up into life? Because of his righteousness. But the moment that sin entered, what happened? Things started dying. The moment that the flesh gets involved, go back to the first part of that verse, the body is dead because of sin. The wages of sin is death. No way you can avoid it. Anytime sin gets involved, there can be no righteousness. What once was righteous has now been defiled. It's got to be sanctified again. You know who can do that? Only somebody that's righteous. He can redeem things that have fallen and restore them to where they used to be. You can't do that on your own. You can mess it up on your own, but you can't fix it on your own. Anybody that's still trying to help God out, piece things back together, they'll never get back together. Clay has no say in what the potter does to it. Right? The arrows in the quiver of an archer, as the psalmist used the analogy, they don't get to pick what they're pointed at, when it's launched, how many times it gets shot at a target, or how many times it ends up in the dirt. That's all in the archer's hands. You know what the arrow's job is to do? To keep itself held together and to fly straight. It holds on to the fletching, why? So that it flies true. And it holds on to the arrowhead so that it actually makes an impact. It leaves a mark. It did what the archer wanted it to do. But if something were to happen to that arrow, you know who would have to mend it? The archer. The arrow can't fix itself. The arrow didn't put the arrowhead on it or the fletchings in it. That was the archer. The archer just said, you be what I made you. And if something happens, I'll fix you. But after that, I still expect you to be what I made you. But what I want to talk about, thought that the Lord gave me today. Verse number six, for to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. One thing I see a lot of, not just in Christian folk, people all over the world. There's a whole lot of confusion. God's not the author of confusion. You know where confusion comes from? The flesh thinking that it was right and being proven wrong. I see a whole lot of anxiety. We've already said because of the last part of this verse. He's the prince of peace. You know what the prince of peace has? Peace. He don't have any anxiety. Or else they would have called him the prince of anxiety. He has peace, but yet lots of anxiety, worry, a lot of frustration. I find that sheep never really complains about where it's led. As long as it's with the shepherd, it's content. Doesn't mean that he likes where he's at now, but he knows that the shepherd's taking him somewhere better. He's content. There's no frustration. There's no rage against the state of current affairs. In fact, anybody that has life on their mind, they're focused on the only place that you can find life. That's not in this world. That's somewhere up in the third heaven where in the sides of the north God has his throne and standing at the right hand of God is Christ. That's where life is. But yet to be carnally minded is death. Now I know this is Sunday school. I presume most of y'all say But to be carnally minded, even after you're saved, you know what that's going to bring into your life? A whole lot of death. It's going to kill your joy. It's going to kill your satisfaction. It's going to kill your sense of purpose. 
It's going to kill the drive to get up and to go out and do something for the Lord. It's going to kill a whole lot of what God birthed in your life. I'm convinced that people sitting on church pews, a lot of their anxiety issues would be solved if they just got a better dose of Him. You know why they're so worried about things that are out of their control? Because their mind is on the things that they can't control. Now, I'm human. I've done it. Still do it every now and then. i got to rebuke the flesh, apologize to God, ask Him to forgive me. But to be carnally minded, that means that you're left with carnal solutions. Anything that you get your hands on in the flesh, you're going to make a mess of. You keep trying to fix it long enough, it's going to be dead. Right? There's only so many ways you can try to fix a cake before you got to say, you know, the doctor called it. You can't fix that. Throw it in the trash. There's only so many times that you can glue pieces back together before the glue just stops holding the thing all together. You ever try to put super glue on something and walk away and then 10 seconds later you come back and it's dried already? So you try to put more super glue on top of the old super glue that's dried? It don't stick. Because you've missed your mark. You had a chance and you blew it. You know what's left after that? It's stuck the way that it is. It's dead. It's been separated. It's been broken. Now God can fix it because His ways are above our ways. But I've said to be carnally minded, you're stuck with carnal solutions. You can't tap in to what the Lord has for you because you think you've got the answer. I don't care how good you are with money. You can't solve a money problem with the world's mentality. I don't care that 90 doesn't mean as much as 100, minus an offering, and if God, faith promise giving, if you're giving to missions on top of that, the world say, that can't work. But does in God's economy. How do you know? I've tried them and I've proved them to be true. But you can't solve money problems even with 100% if you're using the world's tactics. Well, it worked for somebody else. Maybe they're smarter than you. Maybe they got a small loan of a million dollars from their father when they started out and they turned it into a couple of billion. All I'm saying is, is that if God can't trust you with it, you ain't going to have it. And on top of that, you can't get it if God's drawn a line and said, you can't have it. Jonah really wanted to see Tarshish. He never got there. God said, your passport's been revoked. Your travel privileges have been, you know, rescinded. You got to go back this way. And God didn't take him to where God wanted him to be. God got him back to where he could make it to where God wanted He didn't spit him up at the gates of Nineveh. He spit him up on dry land. But he still had to make the choice to go to Nineveh. People that all the time that just feel like everything they do, they come out as a loser. I can't help but wonder if they're not carnally minded. If God doesn't hang around with losers, God doesn't let losers into the family. He cleans you up and He made you a joint heir with Christ. He cleaned you up and He gave you a house, a mansion in His house. He's got a place reserved for you at the family table waiting on you right now. You don't know this yet, but in the millennial reign, He's already got a position for you. He said all of my kids get to get in on the Father's ruling reign. He's got a place just for you. He thought so much of you that he said that he would fitly frame you together into a local body of believers so that you wouldn't have to be alone in the flesh. That you would have companions and cohorts and people to help bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. God thinks very highly of you. People that are always so down on themselves, I can't help but wonder if they're looking at things through the eyes of the flesh. Because the flesh is real good at pointing out things that aren't perfect. I know I'm not perfect. In fact, this side of heaven, I know that I cannot be sinless. 
Why? Because I've still got that thing that's on the cross that we talked about that I've got to take with me everywhere. But I'm not trying to be sinless. You know what I'm trying to be? More like Him. The goal every day is to what? Become more Christ-like. Look at where you started at and look at where God's brought you to now and tell me that you haven't grown as a Christian. If you haven't, you've had a very miserable Christianity. You haven't had any victorious Christian living. Why? Because you're still trying to use the tools of the world to get things accomplished in the kingdom of God. Not going to work. I'll remind you. Nehemiah went back to go build the wall. You know what tools they had to use? They had to use the tools of God. They had a hammer to fix the wall, but they also had to take the sword with them. You can't do it the way that you think it's going to work. I don't mind you, there was one time there's a whole bunch of the enemies of the children of God and there's very few of the people that God said met the qualifications. They didn't come up with some great brilliant tactical strategy. You know what they did? They took a light, they put it inside of a lantern and then when the man of God said smash the lantern, they smashed the lantern, they made a great noise. Then it says that there was a noise up in the treetops. They didn't fight that battle. God ran ahead and fought it for them. What happened? They went to go see where the enemy was and the enemy disappeared. They's gone. If they'd have tried to fight it in the flesh, they'd have been whooped. Every day of the week and probably twice on Sunday. They'd have lost it. They weren't mighty men of war. They didn't have great experience. You know what they had? They had a little bit of common sense because that's what God tested before that. And then on top of that, they chose to use that common sense to do what God said. Because the common sense says, God's been right every time that I've ever looked into the issue and I can't find that he's ever been wrong. I think we'll do what God says. That's common sense. Flesh doesn't use common sense. Flesh uses feelings. If your feelings ever get you away from where God wants you to be, you're leaning too hard into the flesh. I find in the Bible there are people that felt every kind of emotion, but yet they still kept themselves right where God wanted them to be. You want a real good example? Go look at Job. Job lost everything. Job didn't even have his own flesh to take comfort in the fact that he is healthy. In Job's mind, death could be right around the corner. He didn't know that God told the devil that he couldn't have his life, but Job felt like he was dying. And where'd he go? He went back to the ash pot. You know where the ashes came from? He was sitting right next to the altar. Where'd he go back to? The same place he always did business with God. Except he knew he couldn't put himself on the altar because he was defiled. He said, Lord, you can have the ashes that's left over because that's all I got left. But he said, everything I am, it's still yours. Show me one place in the Bible where if somebody, because of faith, exercising the faith that God gave every man a measure of, and by compelling the flesh, flesh didn't want to do it, but they compelled it to do it. Show me where because they did what God said God didn't keep them where God wanted them to be long before the feelings start coming up that caused somebody to finally walk out the door their heart left a long time ago where do you think the feelings came from didn't come from around here there's one word I find a whole lot in the Bible when it comes to things that God did it's called satisfying Satisfaction means that it's not just that you were pleased with how it was done. It means it went above all of your expectations. You can't think of anything else that could make it any better. That's what satisfied means. Satisfied means it was so good, you're not looking for anything else. You just want more of that. Satisfied is what keeps you at the Father's house. The moment that you think that you need something else, that's a fleshly compulsion. The Bible makes it very clear. All you need is Him. 
He promised that he'd always be there, but he also promised that he'd have others along the way that he'd send by to what? Edify you, encourage you, strengthen you, to build you up on your most holy faith. Because God wants you to not just know that you're not alone. He wants you to see that you're not alone. Like Elijah under the juniper tree, every now and then he's got to send somebody by our way and say, hey, there's still a couple thousand over there that hadn't bowed the knee. They still stuck to the old paths. They're just where God wants them to be. Just because you haven't seen them doesn't mean they're not out there and that God's still not up to something. The carnal man's the one that unsatisfaction comes. Now, the Bible makes it clear that without a vision, the people perish. God may give you a desire to do something, but a desire to do something and the compulsion to do something are two different things. OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, you know what it means? It means that if in your brain it's wired that if you don't do it, something bad's going to happen. So you feel like you have to do it. That's a compulsion. You know what a desire to do something is? It'd be nice. Right? It's a desire to do something, but you don't have to do it. If God says, I want you to do this instead, it doesn't affect your spirituality. All it means is that just because he didn't say I could do it now doesn't mean he's never going to say it. He just wants me to do this right now. A desire is something that comes from a love of something. You know why husbands ought to buy things for their wife just because they know that their wives like them? Because they have a desire to do that because they love their wives. Same is true about women for their husband. If you truly love something or someone, you desire to do things to please that person or to strengthen your relationship with that thing. Your desire to do something from the Lord is not because you want to go do something. It's because you want to find pleasing. You want to be pleasurable in the sight of God. You want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.